thanks very much for, uh, for for joining us today. It's um it's another excellent attended webinar. I feel like I say this every single time at the moment, but this this is probably one of our most well attended webinars that we've got, and I think that's testament to um so obviously the speaker that we've got today, the the, the subjects that we're going to be covering. And um, yeah, I'm delighted, Simon, that you've taken the, the, the time to come and come speak to us today. Obviously, Simon and I have known each other for, for quite a few years now. Um, I've always admired, obviously, the, the work you've done with the Accountants Mastermind group. And I know that, that users do, and, 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 the, and the people within the group also really respect your, your advice that you give, because, of course, you, you've been there, you, you do it every day with, with Greenstones as well. So, uh, so, Simon, thanks very much for myself for coming and taking time to speak to the audience today. What, what are we going to be hearing from you? Well, we're going to talk about how you get records from your client on time every time. And I know that's a big promise and we might fall short of every time. But if you just take uh, one, two or three of the 14 different ideas that I'm going to share with you this morning, then I know that it will vastly improve the time that you spend uh, chasing people for the information that you want from them. Excellent. Thanks, Simon. So just as a bit of housekeeping, uh, just before we get going, we're not expecting any fire alarms. The, the exits are we're in your own office. But if you do want to submit a question, please use the Q&A box below. Um, Simon's happy to take questions on the fly as we go. So I'll monitor the Q&A box, but please do use that as opposed to the chat box. And um, and I will ask Simon at the, at the right time. So, um, so for instance, Simon, we've just had a question come straight in from, from Caroline saying, could you please advise the best, please advise the best, of to, uh, can you advise the best, please, to obtain working papers if you don't mind? I, 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 I can answer that. Uh, and I, I'm not 100% sure the, the, uh, the, 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 what you're looking or what you're asking there, uh, place, Caroline. Yeah. We, we use Excel working papers, which is long the short of it. So over the years, we've tried all sorts of different things and we end back uh, end up back at Excel. Um, but the more interesting conversation, Caroline, is whether you actually need working papers anymore. So uh, with the, uh, the way that all of the online technology is going, um, whether you actually need uh, to keep a record, uh, and obviously if you do the updates and whatnot within the client records, uh, whether you actually need uh, those working papers anymore. But yeah, as, a, as an accountancy practice, we still uh, use Excel. Perfect. Thanks, Simon. And, and, and that, that's it, guys. Yeah, if you've got a question, use a chat box, and I will chuckle at Simon at the appropriate time. But I suppose, Simon, oh, there we go, we've got another one coming. Oh, can I say thank you? You're very welcome. So, Simon, o over to you, really. Um, Away. Brilliant. So thank you, Jonathan. Um, in case you don't know who I am, uh, I'm Simon Chaplin. I own an accountancy practice called Greenstones. Over the years, we've won all sorts of awards. I've owned that practice for, well, 20 years now, 2002, uh, I acquired it. Uh, in uh, and around 2010, I got a bit bored with doing accounts and stuff like that. So I retained ownership of that, but extracted myself out of the practice and created uh, it was called something different then, but it was effectively the accountant's mastermind. So I work to inspire, challenge and support accountants and their teams to be the very best they want to be. So the ideas and concepts that I'm sharing with you today is things are things that we have used within the accountancy practice in order to help us get their records, get the information in from the clients. And I do honestly feel your pain. I know sometimes it feels like you're banging your head against a brick wall trying to get that information in when, as I say, two, three, four of these simple ideas will help you get uh, that information in. And as Jonathan said, I am delighted to take questions. Any questions on anything that I share this morning, I will gladly take those. Anything around running a practice at all, I will gladly answer those as well to the best of my ability. And as I always say, I love stupid questions. So if you've got a question, you think, oh, I can't ask that because it's a bit stupid. I love those stupid questions because generally speaking, they're easier to answer. So if you feel as though you've got a stupid question, please pop them in the Q&A box and I will gladly answer them along with the hard questions if you choose to. So uh, let me uh, share the screen and start with uh, the 14 ideas. So as I said, we're going to look at how do I get records from my clients on time every time? And as, as I've already shared with you, we've won over the years all sorts of different awards. And it would be remiss of me if I didn't 
uh, share with you that I'm a published author and I've written a book called Banish the Bottleneck and I'll pop that in the chat box so you can go and find that. That's all about how you can create a perfect team and remove you as the bottleneck within your practice. I will also share with you at the end how you can get these three resources. So an initial customer contact sheet, which starts the process in order to get the information from the client, uh, 12 top tips to get more referrals and also 15 recruitment ideas. So without further ado, let's look at how we can implement systems and it's got to be done for me. These things need to be done as a process within accountancy manager. So there's lots of these ideas, but they need putting in the processes within accountancy manager in order to make sure that they get done by your team. Uh, but let's have a look at some ideas. So the first one is book appointments. Okay. If you know you need information from a customer, from a client, then book an appointment in their diary. Either book it in the diary for you to speak to them to get the information or confirm with them when they are bringing the information in. Now, what generally speaking happens within an accountancy practice is, let's we'll talk about a VAT return, for example. The VAT return quarter ends and then you either email them or you ring them, hopefully, within seven days of the quarter end and you ask the client to bring the information in. And almost certainly the client will say, yeah, I'll, I'll do it next week or I'll get round to it or they'll give you some fluffy language. Now, when they say, yeah, we'll bring it in next week or we'll deliver it next week, your response to them should be, okay, on what day? So you're, you're getting some formality to it. So what day? Say Thursday for argument's sake. And then what time? Okay, 10 o'clock. And then you make the appointment with the client to deliver that information to you at 10 o'clock on Thursday. And if you get a specific day and a specific time, they are much, much more likely to deliver the information to you, either physically deliver it to you or deliver it to you over the phone than if you just have a waffly conversation and they say, yeah, we'll bring it in next week. And then you ring them up at the following end of the following week. And then they they say the next week and blah, 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 blah. And they actually deliver it on the sixth for the month following the VAT return and you have to do it overnight. So the first thing is absolutely, and we're going to come back to this with the last point, you need to take responsibility. So it needs to be your responsibility as to when the customer is delivering the information to you. If you just go fluffy with them and tell them to bring it in whenever, then ultimately they'll bring it in as and when it suits them rather than uh, you bring it in earlier. So the first one is book appointments. And if you've got regular stuff that's coming up, so every week they're delivering information or every month they're delivering information for VAT returns or bookkeeping or whatever it is, make sure those diet, those points go, those appointments go in the diary. So it's 10 o'clock every Monday morning that you speak to ABC Limited in order to get a copy of their bank statements, make sure they've posted all the purchase invoices or whatever it is. So book appointments. Second one, and this seems really obvious when you think about it, okay, is help the customer feel the pain, okay? Now, they don't care about air pain. All that people are interested in is their position, the pain that they are experiencing, okay? So it's no good ringing up a customer and saying, oh, well, if you don't bring the information in, we're going to have to work overtime or we're going to have to work over Christmas or we're going to have to work every Saturday in January or whatever it is. They don't care, okay? There's no pain in that for them. What you need to do is to communicate the pain that that customer will experience if they don't deliver the information when you want it. Now, there's various ways of doing that. And again, we're going to cover some more in a moment. But the easiest one is if you think about VAT return. Okay, so we've prepared a VAT return or we're in the process of preparing a VAT return and we're missing, say, four invoices. Now, it's very easy to ring the client up and say, hello, Mr. Jones, we are missing invoices from ABC Limited on such and such a date, such and such a date, such and such a date and such and such a date. Can you let us have those invoices, please? And the client will go, yeah, I'll get round to it. Now, what you haven't done is communicated a, a deadline in order for them to give you the information. But most importantly, you haven't told them what pain it is that they are going to experience if they don't deliver those invoices to you. OK, so change the language and say, hello, Mr. Jones, we need the following four invoices. And if you don't let me have them by the 22nd of the month, for argument's sake, there is VAT of £2,492 that we will not be able to claim on your behalf. 
Okay, so tell the client what pain it is that they are going to be experiencing by you. So with absolute clarity, what pain it is that they are going to be experiencing if they don't give you the information when you want the information. So as I say, very simple again, don't tell them what it is that you want. Tell them what it is that they are going to experience if you don't get it. So help the customer feel the pain. Uh, next up is simply make a note and move on. So you ring the customer. It might be a British Telecom bill, for example, and you know that it's got VAT on or uh, they have a supplier and the supplier invoices have always got VAT on. Uh, you ring the client and say, hello, Mr. Jones, can we have that invoice? And Mr. Jones says, yeah, I've got that invoice. I will send it soon. Yeah. And then all you do is you make a note and move on. You carry on. You file the return. You do the estimate. You put, sorry, you put the document in. You claim the VAT, but you confirm that the client can provide you with the information as and when it is that the client wants it. And I know that's one of the systems that most, uh, most accountants uh, use. So make a note and move on. Uh, next one is to estimate, confirm, and then correct next time. So when we talk about things like VAT, um, obviously, uh, as accountants, we want to make sure that the returns are accurate and when we file them, that they are done properly and all the rest of it. However, you can obviously adjust VAT returns within uh, certain limits. So there's nothing to stop you estimating what the VAT would be on a certain invoice or on a, a certain collection of invoices, confirming that you've done that to the client, asking the client for the evidence ready for next time, and then file the return and make a note on the system to correct it next time. So estimate what it is. And again, you can do exactly the same within, within the accounts uh, or the bookkeeping or anything that you're doing. Estimate what it is that, the, that you're going to claim. Confirm, obviously, that you've done that to the client and then correct it next time. Uh, so again, a really, really simple one. Uh, next one um, is just do not do it. Okay, you get as an accountant, well, as anybody in life, but as an accountant, you get what you tolerate. Okay, so if you tolerate this behavior from your customers, they will continue to do it. So you just don't do the return. You allow them to suffer the pain of the penalties. Now, we're going to talk about, in a minute, we're going to talk about automated emails that the accountancy manager can send out. Now, if you send out, again, we'll stick with VAT returns because it's something that happens very often. If on the first of the month, you send out a VAT, uh, uh, an email that says, your VAT return for the quarter ended, such and such is now due. Can you please let us have the information? A, it's not very good not very strongly worded email and is all a bit is all a bit waffly but if you send that out on the first of the month and then it gets to about the 21st and you ring the client and say hello mr client can we have the records that we asked for on the first of the month what the client remembers is well we had the email but they didn't really want it until the 22nd of the month so i've got an extra three month uh, an extra three weeks before i've got to deliver that information and they're going to ring me up and remind me anyway so if you want that information on the, say, the 7th of the month, you need to be acting on the 7th of the month. And if you're writing to them on the 1st of the month, then you need to make sure that you tell them what it is that you're going to do. So I'll give you an example of a system that we use. We'll email them on the 1st of the month and ask them for the information. If we haven't got that information seven days later, there'll be another email that goes out. If we haven't got it 14 days later, remember we're on day 14 now, so we're halfway towards the uh, VAT return being filed, we will then ring them. And then three days after that, we will confirm by email if we haven't received the information by the 21st of the month, we cannot guarantee that the VAT return will be filed on the 7th of the month. And the penalty implications of that are X. Now, as soon as you've done that, you can't then backtrack. You've got to say what you mean and mean what you say. Because if you backtrack, then you're teaching them that you don't actually mean your words. Talk about personal tax returns. Uh, people have all sorts of issues around tax returns in December and January because the client won't deliver the information, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but there's all sorts of challenges around that. One, I don't believe that as a profession, we ask for the information soon enough. So we'll sit there in July and think, well, we really should be asking for the information, but we've got another seven months yet. So we'll do it next month. We'll do it next month. And before we know we are, we are in November. And the second thing is we don't give the customer clarity around when we want the information. One of the really simple things that we did 
is we stopped talking about the 31st of January filing deadline in the initial correspondence until we had to warn the client about the penalties. And this came up, it was a client, I was talking to a client one afternoon and the client said, well, you don't need the information until the 31st January because that's when the deadline is. No, 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 that's the deadline for the filing. That's not the deadline for the information. And the client didn't understand that. So we removed the 31st of January deadline out of the correspondence, uh, of all the correspondence, right up until we warned them that if they haven't delivered the information by the 31st of October or before, we cannot guarantee that the tax return will be filed on or before the 31st of January. So the only date in all of the correspondence up until the 31st, well, just before the 31st of October, mentions the 31st of October deadline. And the information comes in because they're looking at the 31st of October rather than looking at the 31st of January. And as I say, if you tell somebody that you're going to do that, you're not going to file the accounts or the tax return or the VAT return unless they've given you the information by a certain day. You have to let them suffer the penalty. So from an accounts perspective, we promise to turn accounts around within 45 days of the records being delivered to us. So if the filing deadline is the 31st of October, so the accounts need submitting their company's house by the 31st of October, if you count back 45 days, uh, whatever that would be, middle of September, we will be writing to them at the end of August and saying, if you haven't got the accounts to us by the middle of September, we cannot guarantee that they'll be filed by the 31st of October. And ultimately they pay the penalty. Now, what you'll get, you get people moan about it and all the rest of it. And the response is, okay, so what do you want me to do? I can't, I can't do any more than what I've already done. I've asked you, I've asked you, I've emailed you, I've rang you up. You've promised me the records. We've booked an appointment, et cetera, et cetera. And you've still not delivered the information. How, how am I supposed to improve this process? Now, ultimately, and we're going to, again, we're going to come on to this. There's a question as to whether you want to be working with that client or not going forward, but Ultimately, you have to let them suffer the pain because you teach what you tolerate. You get what you tolerate. So just do not do the record. Just do not file them in the in the first place. Uh, next up, if they are causing you lots of aggravation, then increase the fees. Get paid for the aggravation and the pain that you are suffering because the customer won't give you the information. Now, there's a couple of ways of doing this. Um, one is you uh, build in an, a hassle factor. So the next time that you uh, talk to the customer, you say, okay, you're not delivering the information, blah, blah, blah. Um, and what, we, what we're going to do is because we have to keep chasing you, it makes us less efficient. We're distracting from other clients. So we're going to charge you for the privilege of being uh, uh uh, having to be chased all the time and that's going to cost you another hundred pounds a month or a hundred pounds a quarter or whatever it is now merely having that conversation with the client almost certainly will go oh, they'll go oh i didn't realize that was such a big problem um i promise don't charge me i promise that i will deliver the information as and when you want it going forward and then you can say okay fair enough uh, if you're going to change your uh, behavior and you're going to deliver the information when we want it, we won't charge you. But as soon as you fail to deliver the information, then it will just go on the invoice automatically. Is that OK with you? And almost always the customer will go, yeah, because they believe they're going to deliver the information when they say they are. They're not they're not lying to you. They believe that they are. They're good. They're good people. So obviously you then have to monitor it. And if they continue to misbehave and not provide the information when you need it, then you obviously need to add that. Uh, charge to the invoice when it comes through. So increase your fees so you are being rewarded for the pain. The alternative way is to charge the extra. Say, okay, I believe you. Charge the extra so you raise the invoice and then when they deliver the information, you issue a credit note because they've provided it. So there's two, two ways around. There's some psychology that suggests the second way, charging and then giving it back is more psychologically advantageous to you and the client than it is charging them and then trying to charge them the extra because obviously they're then going to pay for the extra and there's all sorts of stuff that goes uh, goes along with that. So increase the fees so you are rewarded for the pain that you suffer. Uh, next up, uh, custom emails. Uh, again, this is not for everybody, but uh, you set up a custom email for the client. So it's very, very easy to do uh, on uh, Office 365 or something like that. You can set it up as an alias. So at Greenstones, we would have ABC Limited at greenstones.co.uk. 
So if anybody emails ABC Limited at greenstones.co.uk, so ABC Limited is the name of the client, then that email arrives at Greenstones and it can go either to a central pool or it can go to an individual. So they then receive that information. Now, the way that you can use this is that the customer can give that custom email to their suppliers. So say, for example, you've got a builder and they go to Screwfix a lot. Uh, Screwfix, instead of instead of giving the client a paper receipt that the client's then got to scan or make sure it gets to, to you, uh, the client can obviously give them their email address so it gets emailed to them and then they have to email it to you. Or alternatively, they can give the Screwfix your custom email address. So it just comes directly to you. And then within your system, we're going to talk about this in a moment, but in your system, you can set up rules so it automatically gets uploaded to Dex or Water Entry or any of the other systems that you use, HubDoc, in order to process those, process those invoices. So custom email addresses on your system. I don't quite know how it works with Google, but certainly within Office 365, it's really, really easy in order for uh, you to be able to set those up. You can do it in, in a matter of seconds. It also helps the customer feel more important to you because they've got their own email address on your server. And it also helps the customer so they don't have to remember who it is that they're sending it to. So I'm sending it to Ida or Jordan or Bev or whoever. Well, I just send it to themselves, basically, abclimited at greenstones.co.uk. So they don't have to remember and they know that it will get looked after. So there's a question uh, from Ian, Jonathan. I don't know, are we answering that? You are moot, Jonathan. Classic. Um, yes, okay. sorry, sorry, I, mean, I was just going to say you. Uh, there was a question from from Ian on your previous points about increasing fees. Uh, should you write up and issue a new billing contract if you are to increase fees? What's your views on that? De I, wholeheartedly, Ian. Yes. So, uh, produ producer uh, of uh, accountancy manager or wherever it is that you're producing them from, and and get them to sign it. However, that that's not really the point of that process. The the point of having is have the conversation with the client and tell the client how the, or why the relationship is not working and why it's to their benefit to deliver the information to you when you want it. Now, I'll, I'll bet your bottom dollar, there's, there's two things. One, we moan about clients. We talk about pitters and all the rest of it. The two things that we moan about is one, that they don't deliver the information uh, on on time and, and they don't return the the calls and, and stuff like that. And then the standard of records. So the records that they produce, they've not reconciled the bank account or they've not posted invoices or whatever it is. So they don't give us the information and the records that they provide us with are rubbish. Now, if you sit down with any client and if, if they don't behave like this, then for me, there's a question as to whether I want to be working with them or not. But if you sit down with any client and explain that to them, why the information is important and uh, why uh, you need uh, good quality accounting records. They'll turn around and go, oh, I didn't know that my accounting records was rubbish. Oh, I didn't know that I needed to bring the invoices in on time. And you are helping them help you. They just, they want to help you. It's a relation. It's a relationship. Now, there will be clients I know where it's the last thing on their mind and they don't want to get to it and they want to put it off because they're not making any money and all that sort of stuff. But if you help and explain to them that this is what we need and this is what the consequences are if you don't deliver it, then almost certainly they'll as i say they'll change their behavior and deliver it uh, in the way that you want to if not charge them and rebuild them redo a billing invoice contract of engagement uh, letter of engagement etc etc et elliot's jumped in with uh, what he, he says is a stupid question i'm not saying it's a stupid question he says how do you set up the custom emails uh, so for for me um uh, and it's not a stupid question uh, for me i've got uh, administration rights uh, within Office 365, uh, and they're called aliases. And you just go into Office 365, or one of my team members goes into Office 365, and you set up the alias. Uh, some of the systems call them forwarders, and it just says ABC Limited at greenstones.co.uk. And then in the box to the to the right of it, it just you just say advice at greenstones or tracy at greenstones or ida at greenstones you just say where it uh, where it's uh, gonna go i mean, jonathan from a technology point of view i'm <laughs> perhaps landing you in it there but from a technology point of view uh, i'd imagine you perhaps know more about that than what i do but it, it for me it's very simple 
Yeah, I was, I was just thinking, obviously, it would be, be a great one for our support team, to be honest with you. So if, if, if AM users are kind of looking at doing this and how the ones we try and integrate to be in at AM, talk to the support team. They're always available. Don't charge any for their time and they'll be able to assist you with that. Yeah, it's, it's not. It, it, it takes very little time to do it. And I'm, I'm going to give you another one in a minute about email rules, which is generally speaking what clients want to do and the way and the way they do it because it it catches lots of different things. So that the challenge with a custom email, when it works, it works. The difficulty you've got is you've got to get the client to go in and speak to the right person at Screwfix and all the other suppliers that they're using in order to get that changed. Um, and there's a, there's a whole world of stuff within that. However, once it's done, it's done forever. So there's a bit of pain, short-term pain, long-term gain type uh, scenario. Uh, that's brilliant. Thank you for the questions that we've already had. So uh, next up, as I say, is get them to automate it. So there's no rocket science in this at all. You get them to upload it to Dex, up to Receipt Bank or any of the other uh, vendors, Dex, uh, auto entry or whatever i know receipt bank and dex are the same people uh, but up upload it to them so you they don't have to provide the information to you now i'm going to share a little story with you so we had a bit of a challenge within our office uh, to start with in order to get people my team members to get their customers to use uh, the invoice processing system and there was all this about oh the customers don't want to do it the clients don't want to do it and there's too much aggravation for them etc etc and then one afternoon a chap called mick uh, who was let's just say uh, one of our more interesting customers uh, he came into the office he used to come into the office reasonably regularly to deliver piles of greasy receipts excuse me, and he also smoked. So they smell of cigarette smoke as well. So there was greasy and uh, smoky and lots of the team members didn't want to go and uh, have that conversation. So I'd had a conversation with him about getting him to upload it. Oh no, Mick can't do that. He can't even milk a mobile telephone, that alone, uh, upload it to auto entry and all those sort of things. So anyway, one afternoon Mick came in, I went into the informal meeting room with Mick, sat down and, and had a, a, a bit of a chat. Uh, and then I said to Mick, can you take a photograph on your phone? And, and Mick said, of course I can. And he got it, got his phone out. And he said, why, why do you ask? I said, so what we're going to do going forward, if you want, is... Uh, just take a photograph of these invoices so you don't have to come in anymore. And, and Mick said, well, it's as simple as that. He said, I'll just take a photograph and then I haven't got to keep coming in every week and I can spend that time earning money. And I said, yeah, but instead of using your camera on your phone, you're just going to use a different app. Should we download it? So we downloaded it. And then all of a sudden, Mick had the app on his phone. And now all he does is just take photographs of, of the receipt. So if he's in the petrol station or wherever he is, takes a photograph and uploads it to, in our case, we use um, auto entry. So just merely sitting down with the customer for three minutes, explaining to him how easy it is to do it. He then did it. And there was like this blinding flash within the office. It was like, well, if Mick can do it, anybody can do it. And it was just, as I say, just a really simple thing. So we will sit there and we'll ask, what, what's it? What's it? What's the challenge? Can we help the customer? Uh, understand it and work with it and as i say in mixed case once we'd got that sorted uh, away they went simon so, mean, adam's just jumped in he just wants to know really what, what does your informal meeting room look like so we have in our informal meeting room there's a there's a bit of a bit of a story to it we're on an industrial estate and um it's, it's the usual situation where people walk in and, and we walk it walk they walk into a foyer I didn't want a team member out there all the time on their own. And I didn't want people to be stood out there having meetings in, it's not a public environment because it's our office, but it's, it's cold. It's quite tiled floor, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we have four meeting rooms within the office, one of which is an informal meeting room, which you can't book. And basically you go in, there's some soft chairs in there. There's a, a little table, some water and, and various, uh, some, sweets uh, and various other different things so if anybody comes in and they've not got an appointment then they're taken through into the informal meeting room asked if they want a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or whatever uh, and, and away we go so it's, it's not it's not uh, any rocket science or anything like that within that um, but it's just a place where we know that we can take a client that will be comfortable and they will be uh, obviously have the confidential aspect of it as well 
they got any other questions on that, Adam, I will gladly um, answer them. Uh, so, yeah, get them to automate uh, the invoices and, and the information. Uh, if, you, if you can't get them to uh, uh, connect uh, zero, so this again, this seems a little bit strange to me because it's an obvious thing to say, but I know that lots of customers have a problem doing the bank feeds in zero because they press it in zero and it takes them off to Barclays or wherever it is. And then they have to put the authorization in and then they have to sync it, give it permission. And then it goes back and it's all a bit complicated, but there's a, there's a couple of systems out there, analytics and stream connect that enables you to do that on your phone as well now. And I know it's still flipping over 90 days and all that sort of stuff. So you have to continually do it, but there are systems that are better than the systems that are built into zero in order to get, uh, get your clients to set up uh, the bank feeds uh, and they can also obviously if you haven't got somebody that's on zero in those scenarios you can get the information by them sending you a csv of the bank statements so you don't have to retype or get pdfs of the bank statements so and then so you can use excel spreadsheets and all the rest of it so again there's two, two really analytics and stream connect really really useful for getting information from um, customers that are less technology savvy than the people that can tick the buttons on uh, on zero. Uh, so the, the, the next one that I'm going to share with you uh, is email rules. So get the customer or you via Zoom or any of the technology that you've got, you go onto their system and create rules in their Outlook or whatever email client that it uses in order for them to send information to you automatically. So a couple of examples of how we use this. If we you can put up in the in, in the subject line, if it contains the word invoice, then that email is automatically forwarded to Greenstones. If it contains the word receipt, for example, it can automatically be forwarded to, to Greenstones. If you've got a client that can't get a supplier to change the email that's coming to them with, with the invoice, then they can set up a rule that says all emails from abc limited or Screwfix or whoever it is they get forwarded to greenstones as well so it's it's a bit clunky that one is compared to all the others but if if you can't do it for whatever reason or the client can't do it for any reason then it's a bit of a fall back a bit of a stop safe in order to enable them to send it to you and obviously from your end you can also do the same so if you've got emails coming in to you and you can't get the client to send it direct to auto entry or any of the systems if you've got them coming into you and you know they need forwarding then you just create a uh, email a, an email rule to do that for you automatically simon so, you've touched on something here and we had a couple of questions come in uh firstly can you supply more information about the systems to reconnect the bank feeds in zero then yeah i was having real issues with this Okay, Gail. So there's two that I know of predominantly in the market. Uh, there's an, an organization called Stream Connect, and there is an, another one called Analytics. Uh, if you go to my YouTube channel, uh, which is uh, uh, youtube.com forward slash socks up Simon, and I'll sort that out and post it in the chat box in a little while if Jonathan uh, can't find it. But um, if you go to the YouTube channel, there's demonstrations from both of those organizations, so Analytics and uh, stream connect and it will talk you through uh, the process and, and as i say you know when you log on your phone it, and it does your face activation so they can authorize access via their face and their pin number rather than having to do it over a web browser so bo both of those and a, neither of them need an app as far as i remember they just work through so you don't have to download anything it just works through uh, the banking app that's on the on the phone and secondly, is there a way of getting Zero to send an automatic reminder to clients about relinking their bank accounts before the 90 days is up to avoid any gaps in their Zero accounts? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I would imagine if you go into Practice HQ or something like that, there, there may well be. However, um, I am anti-automated reminders unless they are done properly. So... Um, we'll touch on this now because it's something that's going to, I'm going to talk about in a moment. But you know what it's like if you constantly get an automated email from a supplier uh, or somebody that you've used from a customer that, uh, sorry, uh, that, that is exactly the same every time, you know, you just, it just, it, you blind it out. You just 
you just don't see it anymore. It's a bit like a picture on a wall or uh, when you go drive down a particular road, if you see it all of the time, your brain just filters it out because it's not, it's not relevant. So if you're sending automated emails, something needs to happen in those emails in order to catch people's attention. As you know, you're getting loads of emails in your inbox. And if it isn't, it soon disappears off the bottom of the list. And if it isn't top of the list of things to do, and I can assure you reconnecting a bank fee to zero via uh, Barclays Bank app or whatever it is, is not top of the list of things that your client want to do. It just disappears. So if you're sending automated emails, whether it be through Xero or through Accountancy Manager, you need to change them regularly. So the language is different and as proactive as the language could be. And you need to do something to catch the person's attention. And the easiest way to do that is to change the subject line. So when the email arrives, it's the first thing that you can that you can see. Uh, and you can do that with the words and you can stick emot- emojis in it. You can stick the customer's first name in it, something like that. So if you've got an automated email that goes out every quarter in order to ask the client for the VAT return information, you need to have a note on a system somewhere within Accountancy Manager to say, update that once a quarter. If it goes out once a month, you need to update it every month. So it feels different. Even if it says... Um, hello, uh, we're at Easter already uh, and it's time to file your VAT return or hello, Merry Christmas or whatever. Hello, have you been on your holidays yet? So something that engages the client to get them to think about it and respond uh, as best they can to you. So I'm not saying don't use auto uh, auto generated emails because they're a fantastic time saving thing. You just need to be you can't just forget, do it and forget about it. You need to be improving it all of the time. I think that kind of covers up on this point where it says, uh, do, do you use accountants manager for automatic reminders? Um, obviously, lots of, lots of users do, and Simon can try and give us some advice about trying to make those even better than what they, they already are. Yeah, de- de- definitely, wholeheartedly. The, the automated reminders within them, is a, a, I, am, I am definitely in favour of them. Uh, changing them, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the language in a moment, but changing them so they are uh, unique or more unique So it prompts the brain to look at it from a customer perspective and do something about it. Um, And then ultimately you need to uh, be be on the telephone. So if they're not delivering the information, but you you need to have clarity over what it is that you are going to do. Um, Another really, really simple thing to do, and it it amazes me how many people don't do this. You you speak to one of your team and the team say, oh, I can't get this information out of Brian. And, and, and the client will go, well, why didn't you tell me? And the team will say, well, I didn't know I needed to tell you that I couldn't get the information out of Brian. It's like, okay, so we have an escalation process. Yeah, so I talked to you earlier about seven days for an email, 14 days for an email, three days later for a telephone call, 21 days for an email. If it's not at that 21 days and they're an A-grade customer, yeah, does that need to be escalated to a customer manager in order to have the conversation with the client to make sure the information is delivered? Yeah, so what happens if it if it's not working when is it escalated up the hierarchy for one of a better phrase the people that have got closer contact with the client in order for them to take action uh, so yeah wholeheartedly um wholeheartedly do that um the next one which is a bit scary for lots of people is sackum okay now we'll go back to the conversation that i had a moment ago about communicating with the client about what the problem is before you get to this stage. So for me, we have always had the conversation. Client says that they're going to change it. We then increase the fee if they don't change it. And if it continues or they keep moaning about the fee, then we tell them that we don't want to work with them anymore. Now, as soon as you tell somebody that you don't want to work with them anymore, it's like rejecting a girlfriend or a boyfriend or or whatever. It's like people don't like that rejection. They don't like to think that they've done a disservice to somebody else. And this is all about fairness. Okay. Now, we have conversations and it's changed slightly over the last few years, but we used to have conversations with 12 customers a year. So the team used to work out who it was that was causing them the most aggravation. And we used to identify 12 customers. And then every month we'd have a conversation with one of them about why and how the relationship wasn't working. 
And as I said a moment ago, it's almost it's like this moment where the customer goes, oh, I didn't know that I needed to deliver the information. I will make sure that I do that. Or I didn't know that I needed to sign those tax, uh, that back return or sign the accounts or whatever. Or I didn't know that I needed to post a wages journal or reconcile the wages journal. And as soon as you communicate it with them, then they want to do it. But the, the ultimate is you sacking them. OK, saying that you don't want to work with them anymore. Now, I know that provokes all sorts of emotional responses in lots of it. It's like, well, there's, that's that client's worth three thousand pounds a year, for example. I can't let that client go. It's one of my biggest clients. Now, whilst you're working with that mindset, the client has control of the relationship. OK, so the person and this is all a negotiation. The person that's strongest in any negotiation has the best plan B. And if you are letting the customer, you are tolerating the customer's behavior, what you're saying to yourself is you're not worth it and your plan B is weaker than the customer's because you believe that customer can go and get the service that they're getting from you from any other accountant, which is rubbish because you're unique. You deliver the service in a way that's unique to you. It might be the same service, but the way you deliver the service is unique to you. So the customer doesn't want to go, but if they do want to go because they've been a pain in the bum to you then let them go and i know every single time that i have this conversation with a client there's that fear of replacing the income but when the clients had the com the accountants had the conversation with the client and the client's gone ultimately something else comes along to fill that grf gap that that client <clears throat> the accountant has suffered by letting that client go and we have let some big uh, greenstones we we let her second biggest client go many years ago and financially we never even knew that we'd let that client go because it was replaced by other work that was that was coming in i'm not saying that's easy and it was scary at the time it was a significant number for for, for us as a practice but as i say i've lost count of the times that i've had that conversation you need to believe in yourself that you are as good as what you as, as good as what you are so if it's not working, let them go. Free yourself up to do more valuable work. Uh, next up is text messages. And I know you've got this uh, within Accountancy Manager. Text messages get a far better response than what emails do, but you need to use them. I won't say sparingly, but you can easily upset a customer if you send too many text messages because text messages on a phone they tend to be personal i know you get surveys and stuff like that from different people now uh, when you've been speaking to them but text messages tend to be uh, more personal and therefore you need to use them sparingly but if you send a text message to a customer they are much more likely to respond to it almost instantly than what they are if they've got an email and it's sat on the desk um, or whatever you just need to as i say you just need to use it more sparingly now, one of the things that you can do is set up a text message in order to chase the customer repeatedly. So you've sent them a tax return. For example, you need that tax to be returner to be recite to, to be signed. So you can set up a text message to chase them every day or every three days until they've returned that return. Now, you'll get one or two things. They'll either sign the return or at some point they'll ring you up and say, Simon, will you stop sending me these? text messages i'm getting fed up with sending them text messages and then your reply can be yeah i will send i'll stop sending them as soon as you sign that tax return that we want back please send them send them back and i'll stop sending the text messages now in the good old days when we had p35s uh, and we'd obviously got a time scale that we needed to get them filed by we had text messages going out daily and emails going out daily from the automated system in order to get them to sign the p35 so we could submit the p35 and we had a number of conversations with customers that were upset about the number of reminders but everybody saw the clarity uh, when we explain to them just sign the return we can file it we can all go to bed and and, and we'll all be uh, we'll all be happy so I'm one, yeah yeah just going to say a question just jumped in about using whatsapp instead of text messages and um, some clients insist on using whatsapp because it's free what, what's your experience of using whatsapp in business I, I, we use WhatsApp uh, a, a lot, uh, and I, I really like WhatsApp. I'm a massive fan of WhatsApp. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed at how many people don't know the functionality of WhatsApp uh, and being able to transmit documents and all the rest of it. However, a text message to the text message system on your phone, it, it's more 
more personal and now WhatsApp and all the rest of it's taken off. People get very, very few text messages. I get hardly any text messages. So if I get a text message, it's like, oh, who sent me a text <laughs> who sent me a text message? So in my experience, text messages get a better response than WhatsApp. But if that's what your clients are telling you, um, definitely go to WhatsApp. And if it's working for you, then carry on doing what you're doing. If you're getting a response on WhatsApp, carry on doing it. Don't change it if it's if it's working. If it's not working, experiment and play with something else. Okay, uh, so that's text messages. Again, we're getting towards the end there. A really, really simple one. And again, it just it makes stupid sense to me. But tell the customer that they can take pictures. OK, so they don't have to take a picture and upload it to auto entry. They don't have to come into the office with the invoice. They don't have to email it to you. They don't have to print them out or any of that sort of stuff. All they can need to do is take a picture and either WhatsApp it to you or text message it to you or email it to email it to you or whatever it is that they want to do. But explain to them that you don't need the original. It's like some people and I. We are, I mean, we are digitalized, but it's, it's, we've still got customers that didn't know that we don't need the physical copy of the invoice because nobody's ever told them. And it's like we'll have team members sit in the office moaning about the fact that Dave is still bringing in invoices. But have we ever told Dave that we don't need the invoices anymore? We don't need uh, boxes and boxes of stuff. Just take pictures of what it is that we want. The second point to this is how we communicate what we want to the client. Now, uh, a classic example of this for us is the authentication codes. When we're onboarding a client, um, obviously we, we request authentication codes that go to the client. The client needs to give us the code so we can put the code into the system to connect all the loops. And we was having great difficulty getting those authentication codes back from the client. And ultimately, as you know, if you don't get them back within seven days, the code's out of date and you have to go through the process again. All we did was take a photograph of what the authentication code packet looked like, blanked out the client's details on that authentication code. And then when we send the email out asking the client, so the email says, hello, we've requested an authentication code for you. It should arrive within the next two or three days. As soon as you've got it, can you let us have it? All we did is in the email, we put the picture and it says, you should get an authentication code in the next two or three days. It will look like this. Please let us have it straight away because the code expires. And just putting in the picture of what it looked like massively increased the response rate. So we very, very rarely now have to chase somebody for an authentication code on day six because they know what it looks. So what can you do to give even more clarity to your customers about what it is that you want? It's easy for you to say, oh, I need a bank statement or I need a higher purchase agreement or whatever it is, but they are not their language, not always, but lots of the customers that we work with, their language is not the same as ours. We talk technical because we don't know that it's technical to the customer. So can you demonstrate to them, take a photograph of them, give them an example of what it is that you look like, uh, uh, you want. And taking pictures is a fantastic way of doing that, both from them and for you uh, going out to them. Uh, last uh, but not least, is mind your language. Okay, so language is very, very, very important. And the way that you use the language tells the client lots of things about how and what it is that you need. So if you're ringing a client and say something along the lines of, um, hello, Mr. Jones, uh, we're missing four invoices. When you get around to it, can you let us have them? That's obviously, it's really, really rubbish rubbish language if you get a chance can you send us the input absolutely uh, rubbish language there's two in particular that people use in business that are, are, are incredibly weak the first one is try so can you try and do that for us well try automatically implies failure so you can't try and do something you go to star wars and listen to yoda you either do it or you don't do it if you use the word try, then it automatically implies failure and the client is less likely to do it. So stop your tries, your shoulds, your coulds, your woulds, your ifs, all of that flowery language and tell the customer what it is that you want. Mean what you say and say what you mean. The second one is people say things like, don't forget, 
Okay. Now the brain has real difficulty processing negatives. So if you use the words, don't forget, the brain puts aside the don't and only hears the forget. So if you write, don't forget it's your back quarter year end or back quarter end, please let us have the information. Your brain's gone, oh, forget it's the quarter year end, blah, 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 and fails to deliver it. So instead of using the negative language of don't forget, change those words to please remember. Okay. So instead of don't forget, use please remember. Please remember to deliver the information for the court render. Da, 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 da. Yeah. And you again, you will see it's very, very subtle, but you will see an improved response to your communication just by working in the positive rather than the negative. So have clarity over what it is that you want, when it when you want it by, and the consequences of what happens if you've not got that information. Uh, delivered by whatever date that it is that you want so be very careful and that verbally as you're talking to the customer and definitely in the auto mails that are going out from the system so please remember and get rid of all if should could would tries etc etc um, and then the last one that i've got to share with you is to take responsibility so it is our responsibility. We are delivering the service to our customers and it is our responsibility to serve them to the best of our ability. And if the customer is not doing what it is that we want to do, then it's our responsibility to help them change, educate them or whatever it is that you need to do in order for them to do what you want to do. So communication any communication that we deliver is only as good as the response it elicits so if it's eliciting a rubbish response change your communication don't sit there on a friday night with a glass of wine moaning that this is happening and that's happening moaning on a sunday in january because you're having to work seven days a week until 10 o'clock at night in order to file all the tax returns that they are not that's not the customer's problem that's not their responsibility. It's your responsibility to improve your communication and get the information when you want it or decide to stop working with that client. Now, if you're going to prostitute yourself because of the fees and you want to work late at night and all the rest of it, and that's your justification, fair enough, but shut up and put up. That's your decision. You've decided to do that. Now, the last thing that I want to say about taking responsibility is making sure you confirm with the customer what the next step is. So if we're ringing the customer on day 14 and saying, hello, we really need your information by the 21st of, uh, the, 21st of the month, you need to tell them what you are going to do if that information isn't delivered by the 21st of the month. So if you're going to call them again, tell them what's going to happen. So I'll give you a ring in a couple of days. Yeah. If you make an appointment for 10 o'clock on Tuesday for them to deliver their accounting records and they don't deliver it, then you need to be ringing them up at five past 10 on that Tuesday morning and saying to them, hello, you agreed that you was going to deliver the information today. Where are you? And they'll either say, well, I've got stuck in traffic or, oh no, I forgot. Okay. So when will the accounting records be ready? Thursday. Okay. What time? So it's always all of the, all of the process is your responsibility and you need to take final responsibility in order to make sure that that records those records are delivered to you at the time when you want to so they are my 14 uh, different ideas in order to help you get the information from your client whenever you want uh, on time uh, every time and then what i'll do is over in the uh, chat box i will pop uh, there's a the website, as I promised, and the free resources and also uh, my LinkedIn uh, connection as well. And then if anybody has got any other uh, questions around this or any of the other things, then I will gladly uh, have a conversation with you now or you can uh, WhatsApp me or LinkedIn me or whatever uh, going forward. Excellent. Thank you very much, Simon. What I want to do is, is launch a poll just to follow up really on the session. Um, if, if you're interested in hearing any, any further information from Simon at all, um, if I just launch this poll, it should be a poll on your screen now. If you want to hear from Simon, um, please do just tick, tick yes, and I'll, I'll pass your details over. Simon will be in contact with you. And again, if, if um, although I, if you're not already an accountancy manager user and, you, and you're interested in hearing more about our software, again, please let please tick yes, and again, we'll be in contact with you. So that's Simon, there's lots, lots, lots of following up to do on, on the back of this, which is I'd, I'd, I'd love it. So the, my my whole my whole process, Jonathan. So two two things. 
firstly, if you're not an accountancy manager user and you've not got any practice management software at all, then sort yourself out. It's the, it's the long and the short of it. So I, I, talk, I talk to people and it's like, well, how do you manage the processes in your practice? How do you know when the VAT returns are due and the, et cetera, et cetera? And it's like, well, we don't. Or uh, it's all in my head. Or Excel spreadsheets. It's like, hey, how on earth do you... It's like you could save so much time using a uh, uh, accountancy manager, systemizing the process so it sends the automated stuff that you update and change get the information in, you know exactly where you are. It's just an absolute, absolute no brainer. So that there's, if you're not on a county manager already, then you need to be having a conversation with Jonathan and his team in order to uh, explore those possibilities. You will save, well, masses of yeah. your The return on investment of implementing a piece of software like that properly is, is, is huge. Just want it. One word of caution, and again, I talk, and you'll get this a lot, Jonathan. It's like, well, it doesn't work for me. Now, it's not an instant fix. You don't just pay money to Jonathan or pay money to a accountancy manager, and then the following day, it's like unicorns and candy floss and all that sort of thing. You need to invest the time in making sure the system works for you. But yeah, that's an, an absolute no-brainer. Uh, and then the second thing from conversations with me, as I said at the beginning, it's all about inspiring, challenging, and supporting you to run the best practices you can. And if I can help you do that, whether you're paying me or not, is, is relevant obviously paying me is a really nice thing but i will, if you're going to take action and do something with it i will gladly i will gladly give my time and help you excellent thank you very much for that simon and um, barnaby has a, a, a question he says how is your team structured to pick up client emails dedicated bookkeepers or members of staff that have client base and do and they do uh, bookkeeping and accounts so we we have uh the the, the way the simple structure uh barnaby is we have uh, customer managers that have predominantly have the relationship with the client. Uh, and then we have bookkeepers, uh, what we call accounts in charge, which are people that produce the accounts, uh, statutory accounts and the real time accounts uh, and payroll. When we take a customer on, they are introduced to the four as a maximum, the four different people that they're going to be hearing from in order for us to look after their affairs. So that the different points of contact, uh, the customer has different points of contact. Now, just one thing with that uh, if you've got lots of team members people say well my my customers then they tell me they don't know who they need to talk to which is is, is just is rubbish so two, two things firstly you need to communicate more clearly on who it is that they need to talk to and secondly if you're introducing a new team member they need to introduce themselves and again it says really silly so you've got junior team members that will be ringing up and going hello mr jones can i have such and such an invoice and mr jones is sat there going i don't know who you are so what you do is you get the team member to ring up and go, hello, Mr. Jones, I'm Jordan. I'm ringing on behalf of Mark or Mark's asked me to give you a ring, whoever their main contact is. Can we have those four invoices? Uh, and away they go. But for me, uh, the service that Greenstone's delivered, it's, Green, it's Greenstone's that's delivering the service, not an individual. And as I said, that's one, one of the core points of the book. Um, you need to remove yourself as the bottleneck because you, you've got finite capacity. Uh, you've only got 24 hours in a day like me. And if you're not, if you are the central hub of it, sooner or later, you're going to run out of hours. Um, so it, it has to go. It, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Excellent. Thank you, Simon. Um, somebody's asked, does AM charge for text messages or is this part of the monthly fee? No, that is, that is an additional charge on a credit basis, charged at 5p per text message. Um, you can get bundles of those in the system. Excellent, Simon. We're, we're pretty much at time. Um, I think just a fi final quick question for me to kind of finish off. It certainly jumped out to me when you're talking about Mick and his, and his sticky records and, and, and Dave and his, and his invoices. Those are obviously bad examples of how clients give you information. Have you got some, some good examples of how clients send some cost information to you? Uh, yeah, we've got, we've got people that have got all, all of that lot set up so we, we don't even have to touch it. So the first that we know about it is it arrives in, a, we, as I say, we use auto entry. Um, so they've got their custom email set up, their forwarding set up. We've got uh, a, a, one of our biggest clients. Um, the, they never see the invoices. It goes directly into auto mail. We process the invoices um, and then they get a statement and they approve which ones they want to be paying. And we act almost like a complete outsource finance function. So um, it's, it's all it's all possible. And 
uh, as I said, my last slide, it's about taking taking responsibility. And it's very easy for people to turn around and go, well, the clients, the clients are rubbish they're never going to deliver the information but it's not it's about it's about you and and you sit there and say well okay well, we'll do it next week I'm, I'm too busy this week it's going to take me three minutes to process that email i'll do it today or do that invoice today whereas if you just spend five minutes and have that conversation next week it might only take you a minute and it's that minute 52 weeks of the year that saves you an hour uh, over the course of the time so uh, yeah there's there, i've got umpteen examples where it works really really well i mean we don't we haven't worked a Saturday, done any overtime in January for donkey's years. We had 90% of our uh, tax returns filed by the 30th of November uh, last year. So it's just, it's, yeah, it's just, it's not, it's unheard of. I am going to let everybody go, but I'm going to answer this, this final question that I've just seen coming from Elliot. So he's just asking you, Simon, uh, what sort of team members do you have as bookkeepers? Are they trainees or older people? Um, I don't know whether I'd, I'd class either of them as older people. They're both younger than me, but perhaps I am. Perhaps, um, they have a no, let's just say they have a number of years' experience. Um, uh, they would be uh, early thirties and late thirties. Uh, uh, we have got people that do some of the transactional processing that are a lot younger than that, so late teens, uh, early twenties. Whether that Elliot is um, being targeted, or whether you can teach an old dog new tricks, um, but um, yeah, I'm not. I don't. I don't believe that. It, so for me, I have a fundamental belief that everybody wants to be developing. Everybody wants to give the best they can, and if somebody is struggling to do that, it's because I've not communicated it in the right way, or they're in the wrong job. Um, so yeah, the, I don't think the age of an individual makes a great deal of difference as to whether they can do any of this stuff. Great stuff. Excellent. Simon, well, I think we've, we've answered everybody's questions that we've had today. I think the, the just a chat box and I agree with what everyone's saying, that the advice has been excellent. And I think it's really nice to hear practical advice from somebody who's been there and done it fairly. So uh, so thank you very much for your time and for the advice that you've given the, the group today. Um, and thanks, everyone, for attending. It's been another amazing turnout for, for one of our webinars. So we really appreciate everyone taking the time to come and, come and listen to us today. And uh, yeah, apart from that, all I have to do to wish you all a good afternoon. And uh, yeah, thanks for attending. And Simon, thanks very much for your time. Brilliant. Thank you, Jonathan, for having me. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you. Thanks.